everyone. Um, it is a real pleasure to welcome you to the second day. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, good. The mic is on. To welcome you to the second day of Daniel Conference of the Cambridge International Law Journal. And this is a particular pleasure because it brings fond memories from seven years ago when we organized the first annual conference, and by we I mean the Cambridge PhD law students. And I have to say I'm very impressed by how much progress has been made uh, in these seven years, uh, starting from the conference packs to the organization, uh, to the fact that we're being videoed, uh, and also by the fact that you've thought of inviting people to present the keynote speakers and chair panels, which is something we hadn't thought of seven years ago, so we had to do it all by ourselves. So, without further ado, uh, it is a real honor to present to you a colleague and a friend, Professor Jorge Vinuales, who doesn't really need presentations, so I'm going to make it very brief. So, Professor Vinuales is the Chair of Law and Environmental Policy here at the University of Cambridge, and he's the founder of the Cambridge Centre for Environment, Energy and Natural Resource Governance. In addition to being an academic, Professor Vinuales is also very actively engaged in practice, he is the chairman of the Compliance Committee of the UNWHO Protocol on Water and Health. He is the Director General of the Latin American Society of International Law, and he also acts as of counsel for the LEAF. I don't have enough time to go through all of Professor Vinuales' publications, so I'll just highlight that he has published extensively in the areas of environmental law and development, international economic and investment law, and most recently he is working on a book on the international law of energy. So. I pass the floor on to Jorge, who has one hour, and I will be timing you. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Thanks very much, Rumi. And let me just pick my phone so I have a... Oh, no, it's fine. I use it, the usual one. I have a two-minute start, <coughs> so don't worry. That's good. <laughs> so thank you very much, Rumi, for this kind presentation. It's really a pleasure to be here, and actually, I'm often here in this, in this place giving lectures, but it's, it's a pleasure to be here in, 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 this, in this capacity. And I would like to thank also Patrick and Cara for, for the kind invitation. So given the fact that this is the second day that we have a wonderful dinner and, and, and good wine yesterday, I will be uh, speaking in a more informal way, if you, if you don't mind. Uh, the point of my presentation can be uh, hopefully uh, explained in, in, in simple terms by uh, making a detour. And this detour hopefully is not going to delay the presentation, but uh, take us right to the core of it. And the detour starts with my own collection of international law books. Actually, each time that I'm traveling, I'm traveling quite a lot, uh, when I have time, I go on to a, a sort of old uh, 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 antique bookshop and try to find uh, books, old books, old textbooks of international law. And, and I have a collection in my office, uh, and you'll see what a boring guy. But I, I do have that collection, and one thing that is striking in the, in the books in the late 19th century, and I have a specific example in mind, is uh, this example is, a, is called Principios de Direito Internacional that I bought in Tomar in Portugal uh, a few years ago. It's a, it's a book of 1865 by Antonio de Rosa Gama Lobo, the professor at the Military Academy. And one thing that is striking about this, these books is that they are all divided in the law of war and the law of peace. And uh, most of the developments are devoted to the laws of war. Uh, of course, one from today, one could, could criticize that, saying, well, what a, what a weird distinction, the laws of war and, and the laws of peace. Today, most international law is about the laws of peace, and we no longer call it the laws of peace, we just call it international law. But that would be an anachronism, right? I mean, we would not be uh, fair to the people writing at the time if we were to try to find in 
those books, International Environmental Law or International Economic Law. I mean, what you would find there, well, perhaps you would find some developments on the most favored nation clause, but basically the laws of peace are treaties and consular and diplomatic relations. So this summa divisio between the laws of war and the laws of peace uh, made sense at the time because of the uh, very important place uh, occupied by war in international law. I can give you a, a, another example of, of, of summa divisio that, that will sound a little bit artificial, but that has another historical explanation. Uh, you may have heard about the laws of the non-navigational uses of international water courses. That's a very peculiar way of, of structuring a subject, looking at water and seeing navigational and non-navigational, instead of seeing navigation used for energy, used for agriculture, used for human vital needs, etc., etc. It's a, it's a strange division, but again, it is explained by the fact that historically, water courses were used for navigation. So when they started to talk about uh, uh, other things, other uses of water courses, they just called them non-navigational uses, and that's how the topic entered into the International Law Commission's uh, agenda and then into the Treaty of 1997. Uh, at this point, I guess that you already have it in mind what I, I'm, I'm trying to get to, which is the fact that we're talking about state actors and non-state actors. And what does that mean? Well, that means basically that, uh, I guess, two things. First, that in our conception today, international law is really about states predominantly, and that we feel, even when we're trying to study other phenomena, we feel that uh, non-state actors can be all conflated into one single category, a sort of default category, with everything else. You have states, and then you have everything else. And that everything else can go from uh, a people trying, striving for self-determination to an individual fighting for his or her human rights to a corporation uh, investing in some country to the ICRC trying to defend people in uh, a conflict uh, uh, situation and so on. So it is uh, to international organizations, to the UN, for instance. So it is really a... <coughs> excuse me. My traveling has taken a toll on me. So uh, it is... It is it is quite peculiar, although we don't see it as peculiar because we are used to it. Uh, now, in time, I think that it's going to be seen as peculiar as we now see as peculiar uh, the fact that uh, the writers in the late 19th century and even some, uh, some current books, such as Oppenheim's Treaties on International Law, is still, are still divided in peace and war. Now, using that summa divisio, basically using the summa divisio between states and non-states uh, is not entirely innocuous. It's not, uh, it comes at a price. And what I would like to see is basically, uh, I would like to, to try to clarify what that price is and try to see what is behind that summa divisio. I would like to, to clarify when we speak about international law and non-state actors, what type of inquiries we are conducting, what type of research frames we have in mind. And my uh, proposition for today is going to be that we have two types of inquiries in mind, one which is very much affected by the sort of gravity pool of uh, states, and the other that hopefully is not and will not be affected by it. So in other terms, I'm trying to flag and hopefully start to correct what could be called not an anachronism. So you know that an anachronism is when you plug into the past present categories to understand realities of the past. That may be useful, but at some point, the categories of the present that you plug into the past, that you project into the past, at some point, instead of clarifying the past, start to obscure the past. They are viol making violence to the past. The same thing, I would say, uh, happens with broad categories such as, or summa divisio, such as states and non-states, 
And I would like to show uh, ways in which we are projecting that sort of uh, conception of international law, which is state-centered, and to what extent our research on non-state actors is in fact at, I would say, 80%. It is basically framed in state terms. So what are those two sort of areas of inquiries, inquiry that uh, arise from this summa divisio? Well, the first, which is the one that we are, uh, most of us are practicing and we are applying, is basically an exploration, an analysis, an examination of the extent to which certain norms that were designed for states can be either applied to non-states by extension or can be used to develop new norms for non-states by analogy. Okay? And I will give you plenty of examples. <coughs> Excuse me, I, I'm not... I'm not uh, uh, there was a, a, a change of temperature from my Argentina trip. I, I just came back from Argentina uh, one day ago. So the second category that I will be looking at... Uh, so I present the two categories and then I will discuss each of them by reference with a number of examples. The second category is, is, is basically one that tries to avoid the anachronism, that is not projecting the law of states into non-states, but that is actually looking at non-states without preconceptions uh, shaped by the law of states. It's looking at entities and trying to see how those entities, uh, how the operation of those entities generates normativity, okay, and why that may be useful. So I will give you also many examples, and you will see, hopefully, that uh, the examples are not just new examples, they are old and new. You have many very old, many classic examples of both uh, inquiries. So let me get into the first inquiry, uh, which is the projection of uh, the law of states into non-states. This is, I would say, most of what people do these days. When people st talk about and study and, and explore and, and, and write about non-state actors, 80% of the time what they are doing is actually to project uh, the law of states into non-states. Uh, how can that be projected? Well, I give you some classical examples. And then I will give you some newer examples, so more, more current uh, policy issues. But the classical examples may start with the uh, famous reparations advisory opinion that Olivier de Scooter uh, actually uh, referred to yesterday. Uh, it is a very, very well-known case. Basically, you have the General Assembly of the United Nations requesting an advisory opinion to the ICJ because of what happened to uh, an envoy of the UN in Israel, actually a person, a Count Bernadotte, that was uh, murdered by uh, an extremist group. And uh, the UN actually is asking a few questions to the General Assembly, and the General Assembly will provide an advisory opinion that's going to provide, at the same time, the groundwork for the theory of international organization from a legal perspective so the subjectivity of international organization. And already in that advisory opinion of 1949, you see the two techniques through which the law of states is being projected into non-states. One technique is by extension, is to apply norms that usually are applied to states to non-states. And the other is by analogy, is to actually look at norms that are developed for states and to create a similar and analogous category for non-states. So in this case, the extension is, uh, is provided by the, the, the question of legal personality. To what extent the UN has a legal personality, and the uh, ICJ will say that not every subject of international law has the same scope, and that some subjects have uh, the full scope, some other subjects have a narrower scope defined by the principle of speciality, uh, whereas the extension sort of, this is the extension sort of technique uh, of projecting whereas the analogy technique of projecting uh, is given by the, the concept of functional protection. So the, the court will say at that time, uh, international organizations cannot exercise diplomatic protection 
for uh, one of their agents, but they can exercise something which is akin to diplomatic protection, which is called functional protection, whereas diplomatic protection has to be exercised by the state of nationality. These two techniques, uh, projection by extension and projection by uh, analogy, are very common. And uh, still keeping with the classical examples of how these techniques have been used for non-state actors, let me give you uh, a few more examples. I will give you just as a matter of symmetry two examples for extension and two examples for analogy. I will try to pick major examples, not just uh, tiny ones. Now, one example, uh, let, let's look at ex extension first. Mm. On extension, a typical example is the sovereignty of peoples. So the permanent sovereignty over natural resources that was recognized in Resolution 1803 in 1962 as a sort of addendum to the law of decolonization to provide economic independence. Now, that concept of people's sovereignty over their natural resources is, of course, an extension or, uh, of the concept of territorial sovereignty or of the state's sovereignty over its natural resources. And who else but states could be sovereign? And the reason why peoples are deemed sovereign in that case is that they are about to become states. Okay? So this is a, a way in which, I mean, I could push the example further, but this is a classical example of, uh, of extension, of the extension technique to a non-state actor, peoples. Another example of the extension technique, it's something that uh, I think is going to be discussed further today and was discussed to some extent yesterday, which is basically the application of international humanitarian law using Bello to armed groups. I mean... Uh, and I'm, I, I, to make it less controversial, I would say, to organize armed groups on the basis of the uh, Martins Clause, Common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions, and of Protocol 2, of Protocol 2 uh, to the Geneva Conventions for non-international armed conflict. So it is without question that, uh, to some extent, uh, international humanitarian law applies to non-state actors, to armed groups, uh, uh, treaty law and customary law. But that is, again, a, a, another sort of classical extension, this is a law, this is the law that has been developed for states and is being simply applied by extension to non-states. Okay? Let me give you now two examples. We're always in the sort of uh, range of examples that are classical. Two examples of analogy and I will go quicker here because it is very, very well known. Uh, as you know, the International Law Commission uh, has done a lot of work on the uh, law of treaties concluded by international organizations or between international organizations and states. And there is even a Vienna Convention of 1986 that is not in force uh, that looks at uh, the specific uh, rules uh, governing uh, the, 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 the law of treaties that are not between states but between states and international organizations or between international organizations. If you look at the, at the work of the International Law Commission and at the Vienna Convention, it is not copy-pasted, but closed. So it is very, very, very close. I mean, it was uh, the, the, the eminent Paul Reuter uh, who, who did that uh, work for the International Law Commission, so it's not criticism. The main difference is basically the treaty-making powers, which international organizations have uh, structured differently. And the same, and the second example is, is the law of uh, the responsibility of international organizations. So the responsibility of international organizations, uh, the draft articles that were developed by Giorgio Gaia uh, by the International Law Commission in 2011, they rely very heavily on the uh, ILC articles on state responsibility. I would say that these, these articles are, uh, they differ more, I mean, relatively speaking, they are a bit more innovative. If you look at part five of those articles, which basically uh, concerns the responsibility of a state for an act attributable to an international organization. So that part five is much more specific and you will not find it in the ILC articles, but all the rest is, is, fairly, is fairly close to the ILC articles on state responsibility. You will even find all the same circumstances precluding wrongfulness. So it's, it's quite, so you see that here you're not extending, you're not applying the law of treaties uh, between states or the law of state responsibility to international organizations. 
what you're doing is to use it and extend it by analogy. So you're just so this is a typical way of projecting. These are the sort of the classical cases, the classical examples. Uh, there are uh, closer to us some newer examples that are a bit more controversial. I would just flag four of them in passing, just uh, to, to, to give you a flavor. And what I'm trying to do here is just to show you how pervasive, how widespread is this idea of projection, okay? of projecting the law of states into non-states. So first example, well, to take uh, up the, the example that I was mentioning earlier, and something that Olivier was discussing yesterday as well, which is human rights obligations of certain non-state actors, uh, uh, particularly corporations or uh, some uh, uh, armed groups, particularly non-organized armed groups. So here you have a, a little bit more controversy. Uh, there is nothing preventing from them. I mean, legally, there is nothing preventing uh, a non-state actor from having an obligation. Think of war crimes, for instance. And a non-state actor, such as an individual, may have the obligation not to commit a war crime. So legally, there is nothing in legal technique that would prevent a non-state actor from, from, from having an obligation, but, uh, but this is a typical uh, question that is much debated these days. Uh, another example would be the extent to which uh, uh, states can exercise uh, self-defense against a non-state actor. Uh, that was discussed yesterday by the White presentation, and, and that was addressed to some extent and actually uh, excluded to some extent uh, by the Russian Court of Justice in the Wall Advisory Opinion of 2004. So, but this is, a, this is an open question. I mean, it's a debated question. I mean, my personal view is that it's not possible that, that the rule of self defense will not apply against a non state actor. Uh, so, you will need some form of attribution of the armed attack to the non-state actor to a state where it is the non-state actor is based. But it's, it's a debate, it's a typical projection, projection of, uh, of, of the law of states into non-states. Third example, to what extent uh, a, a group, or a, uh, I wouldn't say a people because this is more complicated, but to what extent a group can violate the principle of territorial integrity. So you may remember the Kosovo advisory opinion where the court actually, I don't want to be too controversial here, but I think that the reasoning in that advisory opinion is very weak, uh, or it is very smart to avoid answering the question. So it is perhaps not weak because it's weak, but simply there was no other way to reach the conclusion they didn't want to reach, so or to avoid the conclusion they didn't want to reach. And basically what the court is saying is there is no violation of territorial integrity because a state is not acting and the UN is not acting. So this assembly is a private actor. What it is exactly, not sure. Is it the people? Not sure. I'm not saying that's not the question. What is it? Well, it's a group of people. <coughs> and as a group of people, you cannot violate the principle of territorial integrity. So you see the, uh, you see the uh, again, the thinking is in terms of the law of states and a projection into the law of non-states. And, and final, final example, uh, closer to, to the area that I teach here in Cambridge uh, is the uh, environmental uh, standards, to what extent these environmental standards can apply to non-state actors such as, not just corporations, uh, 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 I mean international environmental norms, I, I mean not just uh, domestic law, but international environmental norms, to what extent they can, they govern the activities of either uh, an investor or perhaps the activities of the World Bank or the International Finance Corporation or the Green Climate Fund, or any funder, any regional development bank that actually is lending money to someone who is perhaps, by developing a project, violating a number of environmental standards. And the answer to that, of course, will be that they have their own operational guidelines, so what they would be potentially violating is the operational guidelines, but when you look at the sources the, of the content of the operational guidelines, it's always the real declaration of 1992. So you see that both old and new, I would argue that 80% of what we're doing when we're discussing the situation of non-state actors is to look at the law of states and project it into non-states by either analogizing or extending the application of uh, the law of states into non-states. That's entirely fine, that's entirely fine, as long as we know that we are committing a sort of anachronism, 
not an anachronism, but that we are projecting a category that was developed for states into non-states. So in many cases, that projection, that projection, by the very fact that the initial category was developed for states, that projection would not find a correspondence in reality. It will obscure reality rather than clarifying reality. And that is something that sometimes we need to do for, for very, a very simple reason, that most of the international law has been developed for states. So if we are really to apply international law, we are supposed to be looking at international law as it is. So it's normal that we do that type of inquiry. What is not normal is that we do that type of inquiry without knowing what we're doing. And it's very important to know that what we're doing is to project state categories into non-state entities. And by doing that, we are making violence to non-state entities. We are not recognizing their specific features. We are not looking at them as they are. We are looking at them as if they were to what extent they could be treated as states. Now, the second area of inquiry is, of course, uh, less frequent. I mean, I, just to give you a rough, very rough and not quantitative, not quantitatively studied uh, uh, estimation, uh, I would say that the projection type of work occupies between 80 and 90 percent of research, basically. So uh, if you look, if you want to go into the non-projection projection work, basically those, those types of works uh, that, that do look at non-state actors, not as non-state uh, non actors, but as entities, without calling them, without seeing them as non-state actors, but just as entities on their own rights, on their own specificity. So that type of research is 10 percent. And, and I would say that even, even less, because most of it is political science related. So without real legal content. And it is very interesting because you sort of find some form of normativity there, some form of patterns of governance, but the political science literature is not engaging or not engaging properly with the law. And this is something that every international lawyer should know how to do. And unfortunately, these days, uh, I think that there is a trend towards a sort of abandoning international law as if something uninteresting, too technical, too boring, too doctrinal. It is entirely fine to do whatever type of interdisciplinary research you want to do. I do a lot of that. But you are the only ones who will master the technology. If you surrender the technology, if you're not comfortable with the technology of international law, then no one else will. An economist will not do that. A physicist will not do that. A political science will not be able to do that. So that type of research should add the dimension of law as well, I think. And I will give you a few examples of areas where that type of research is being conducted. Uh, uh, one is going to be very simple. Uh, and again, I, I mean, I'm trying to, 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 make, uh, to give uh, classic examples and, 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 and new examples, but let me give you a, a, very, a very classic example. So one area of research where, uh, where this sort of non-projective approach is being conducted is when you, when you actually, when your purpose, your research purpose, is precisely not to be distracted, not to be, not to be misled by the state screen. Okay? And a very classical example of that is international criminal law. There are no crimes of states. Okay? There are norms that can be violated. There may be an aggravated responsibility, but there are technically no crimes of states. So the development of international criminal law was by opposition, by contrast with the state screen. It is the opposite to projection. It's a classical example. It is a classical example, but it is typically is taking into account the specificities of the conduct of war, for instance, and the fact that it is a person who is adopting or making a decision. It is the Kaiser. It is uh, the Führer. It is uh, 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 a dictator that is actually taking the decision, and that was the the approach that was developed starting uh, with the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, in 1920. Uh, in, in, the, in the closer to us category, uh, I would 
to give you one example that is very, uh, very exploratory, which is basically the law of uh, transnational city cooperation. There is a lot of discussion these days about what type of uh, law uh, is being made by cooperation among cities, particularly in connection with climate change. And a typical example would be how do you structure, from an international legal perspective, the linking under Article uh, uh, 6, I think, of the Paris Agreement uh, between the cap and trade system of, I don't know, California and Quebec? Is that an international treaty? Well, of course not, because California cannot conclude an international treaty. To what extent that is an agreement, to what extent that is international law? Well, in fact, you're going to, I mean, there are legal, uh, uh, legal instruments that are used for that, but this is really there you're trying to move away from the state screen and trying to look at the entities as they are and their activities and operations as they uh, manifest themselves. So you're trying to conduct a sort of phenomenology of, 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 of the law, of the legal uh, phenomenon. This is one area where you really want to avoid uh, 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 to be distracted uh, by the state screen or by the, the state projective categories. A second area is when you want to capture uh, certain phenomena of normativity that are not easily uh, captured by a sort of projection from states. I'll give you one example. There is a world between hard law and soft law. A world. There are so many things between hard law and soft law. And if we project these categories of hard law and soft law, which are based on the idea of consent of the state, so they are based on the idea of projection, if we actually disregard this idea of consent, we, we, we are in a way... We, we, we get rid of it to some extent and look phenomenologically at the different forms of normativity, you will capture many other forms of normativity and I will give you one which is a major form that these days, well, just one example, or, or it's actually one, one category of examples, which is uh, what my colleague uh, Jos Pauli has called in, in informal lawmaking, which is, well, many other people have talked about that, but it's, it's really a, an issue of you have the, IS, the ISO, you have the International Bar Association, you have plenty of uh, private uh, institutions making standards that have a lot of influence in practice. And just think for those practicing arbitration, uh, the IBA guidelines on the taking of evidence that are applied systematically. Or if you want something even, even more uh, uh, peculiar, the red firm schedules that are used for document production requests. So this, this kind of thing that arise from nowhere, basically, from nowhere in terms of law, and that have a huge influence, they will not be able to be, I mean, you will not be able to capture their operation by thinking in terms of hard law, soft law, uh, or by projecting this idea of state consent, absence of state consent. Uh, third and a last example of, uh, of ways in which one can take into account the specificity of an entity without projecting the law of states uh, is when you actually want to deconstruct the law of states. And then I will give you an example from a younger colleague, which is, I, I guess, probably one of the most brilliant PhD thesis that I have seen in my career, which is Mamadou Hebiès' uh, thesis, uh, Souveraineté par Traité, uh, which won the, uh, was awarded the Guggenheim Prize, and is basically uh, a historical study for five centuries in seven languages of all the agreements that were conducted by colonial powers with local entities. And it's basically showing that what most of the people who write about the history of international law and even the International Court of Justice when, for instance, in the Western Sahara advisory opinion it is interpreting the uh, legal nature of this agreement are basically wrong. So what you're trying to what Mamadou is trying to deconstruct is the fact that these agreements were actually seen by both parties, the local entity and the colonial power, as treaties. Even though the writers of the time would not accept the idea that they were treaties, and even though the fact, even though that the uh, International Court of Justice would say, 
well, these treaties cannot come for sovereignty because these local entities cannot have sovereignty. The only effect of these local entities is to have ties with the territory that make that territory not a res nullius, but it doesn't mean that they had sovereignty. So they couldn't come for sovereignty. What Mamadou is actually showing through this very detailed study is that basically that's incorrect. That's, that's inc if you really want to take into account the practice of five centuries, not what people were saying in their treaties of international law, what colonial powers and local entities were doing, if you really pay attention to that, and it's a lot of work to pay attention to that, well, you would see that the law was very different from the normative accounts of the law that you would find in books. The approach that you have there is to really take into account the specificity of those local entities instead of plug into them, instead of committing a clear anachronism in that case, is to plug into them the idea of a state and say, well, a state is this. Were they states at the time? No, they were not states, so they could not come for sovereignty. So what Mamadou is saying is, okay, that idea is wrong because at the time the law was different. The fact that they were not states didn't mean that they were not recognized by states as being able to confer sovereignty by treaty. So you see that there are many ways in which you can sort of give back to reality its own features to actually characterize it in a way that instead of obscuring reality, uh, you clarify reality. So there are ways to get closer to the topography of <coughs> what we're calling very broadly non-state actors. And by doing that, uh, you can actually sometimes do very important work because, of course, I mean, for instance, the, the work by Mamadou would completely change uh, a number of the result of a number of territorial disputes, uh, as little as that. So, my point here again is is, to, is not to say that it is wrong, or it is uh, uh, unrigorous, or it is inaccurate to project the categories of the law of states into non-states. This is mostly what we do. I do that thing as well. I mean, we all do these things for a very simple reason. Most of international law is state-centered. And by that, I don't mean that it's, it's uh, providing powers to states and so on. It's simply that it was, it was developed with the state in mind. The state is the white elephant in the room. So it is only natural that we're actually paying attention to that law and projecting it into non-states, this sort of default category. But it is very, very, very important when we're doing that to keep in mind that to some extent we are projecting into reality, uh, into a reality that is not a state, categories that were built for a different reality. And in some cases that may not be a problem, for instance the law of uh, treaties between international organizations, you can almost copy-paste the Vienna Convention of Treaties and it's not a big issue. In some other cases, such as the case that I just gave you uh, about the uh, entity and the powers of local entities in the colonization period, uh, that is a huge problem. So you really have to know, I mean, the, the, the main point is know what you're doing when you're doing it. So that's all I wanted to share with you. Perhaps this conference can actually serve, uh, uh, I understand that you're going to publish uh, a journal issue uh, perhaps that, that this conference can serve to actually clarify that these types of inquiries are very different and that this is not a merely theoretical point, that actually is, it, it can have very practical implications. Uh, as, as Rumi was saying, uh, I, I'm a professor, but I'm a practitioner as well. Uh, I'm much, much more a professor than a practitioner. Uh, I, I left practice uh, or full-time practice uh, uh, years ago. Uh, but I do believe that theory should have some purchase on reality. And if it does not have any purchase on reality, we should be doing something else. Thank you very much for your attention.